Hey, today we're going to create an API endpoint in SvelteKit that'll use JWT or JSON web tokens as authentication. We're going to have a way to generate API keys for your clients, and the clients will use that key to request a token through your auth API, and then use that token to request data from other API endpoints. I also have this code available from GitHub in the description below. To start off, I'm using the JWS NPM module, and I installed it using npm install JWS. I'm also saving the API key to a PostgreSQL database, so I have a PG and types PG installed as well. This, of course, can be done with any other database you have. I also have the homepage styled already and made a quick mock-up API documentation for what we're going to have available by the end of it. This stuff isn't really relevant to the API lesson itself, though. First thing we need to do is make a way for a user on your app to generate an API key and regenerate one if they forget it. Or you can have one already generated for them and give them access to view it anytime they want. This example will go with the first method, though. So here's a button to generate a key. When you click this button, it'll submit a form, and this form's response will contain the new key and will fill it into the input box. Let's make the form submission endpoint first, which will be a matching page.server.ts file in the root of your site or wherever this page lives. In here, we'll create an export and actions object, and in there, the default function to catch the form submission. If you're unsure what this code does or what it's for, check out my introduction to SvelteKit courses as well. In our function, we'd somehow get the ID of the customer, client, user, or whatever that's logged in. Here, I'm just going to manually set it to 1. This is going to be who or whatever you want to associate an API key with. Then we're going to generate a random UUID for the API key, and that's just built in right into JavaScript Crypto API. Next, I'll do a database query to update the customer record and set the new API key. In my example, the customer can only have one API key, and any new ones they generate won't work anymore. Only the one that's currently saved in the database record for this customer will work. Also, this database query function that I'm running is a helper function or module I made for PostgreSQL. I have a video on that as well, but you can use any database or database code you're used to using in place here. Finally, at the end, though, we'll send back the API key we made. Back on the page code, we need to grab the form response now. That's done in the scripts by just structuring form from the props rune. And I believe in Svelte 4, it's just export let form. And below that, let's make a derived variable called API key. We'll use derived by here so the function can be a little bit more complex because we want the API key to display something different based on a few different things. For now, this variable will be the form API key response if it exists and blank if not. We'll come back and add to this later though. Now we can try clicking the button, and as you can see, it fills in with the API key. If we refresh the page though, the API key clears again, and we want to somehow show that one already exists, and I want to fill that in with a bunch of asterisks if so. So back on our server code, let's add a SvelteKit load function, then check if an API key exists for a given customer. And if so, we'll set the API key variable to yes, and then return the API key variable. We don't really want to send the API key here for security reasons. The policy again for our API is that they can't see the key again once it's generated. So hopefully they copied it beforehand. If not though, they can easily regenerate one, but the previous one won't work anymore. You can of course not do it this way if you want and always show the user their key. It's really up to you. Now back on the page, we need to include data in the props now, as that's the incoming object for our load function. And in our derived by function, we can now also check for the existence of a data.api key and make the value be asterisk if anything is there. Now that we have or can generate API keys, we need to provide a way for them to trade that for a JWT token. So let's create an API folder in routes then an auth folder in there, and a plus server.ts file in auth. Auth endpoints are usually post methods only, so let's add the SvelteKit post function. Then we want to grab the authorization header from the request. The user is going to send the API key 
and tokens later in an authorization HTTP header. And this is how you grab that. These by convention have the word bearer space in front of our key or token. So we need to remove that if it exists. Then we need a placeholder for the ID. We're going to link the key to and a variable to track if the request is valid or not. Well, that will query the database for a customer that has the given API key and set the customer ID and valid if so. If valid is still false here, we'll return a 401 not authorized JSON response. And below that check, we'll create a variable to hold when we want our tokens to expire. I have mine to set to one hour from now. When a token expires, a 401 response will get sent back. And that app or person using your API will have to look for that type of response. And if they see it, that just means they need to request a new token and then attempt the request again. That can all be done programmatically by your API user or the app they make and usually happens in fractions of a second in most cases. Now we need to generate a JSON object that'll be any data we want in the payload of our token. Make sure to not put anything sensitive in here. The payload in the token can be read very easily, as I'll show you later. And here I'm just including the customer ID and the expiration date. Then we'll create a new token variable that will be the results of a sign function that's built into our JWS module we installed. This function wants a header and the encryption type, then the payload, and finally the secret to sign it with, and that'll just be our API key. At the end, we'll return the token as a JSON response, and that's how your API users will retrieve a token. After they authenticate though, they probably will want to try to get data from one of your API endpoints. So let's create a simple get endpoint that'll return a list of US cities. So I'm gonna create a cities folder in our API folder, and then in there, another plus server.ts file. This file will contain a get function, which means only get HTTP requests will be allowed here. In there, we'll grab the authorization header again, but this time this is gonna contain our token and not an API key. Users of your API will send the API key in the header to get a token, but send the token in the header to get any other data. So below that, we need to check the payload for the customer ID, get the API key from the database, make sure the expiration date is valid, and validate the JWT signature. But we're going to need to do all this for every API endpoint we have, so potentially dozens of times, if not more. So we really should do all this work in an exportable JS module so that it's reusable. So let's create a client.ts file in our lib folder. And in this file, an exported function that has the same name as the file, but with a capital C. Then in there, an API object that gets returned at the end. And in the API object, a validate function. This function will be async and take in a token to check. It will then return a promise that is a boolean. We'll wrap everything first in a try block so that any JSON or database errors don't kill the app. And in here, let's start by making a placeholder for an API key. Then we'll remove bearer from the token if it's still there. Then we'll use the decode function in JWS to decode it. We can then convert the JSON payload to a new variable called payload and grab the expiration and customer ID from that object as well. If payload doesn't exist or if the expiration date is in the past, we'll return false, saying that's not valid. Then we'll attempt to query the API key from the database using the payload's customer ID. If we didn't find any rows, we'll return false. Otherwise, we'll set the API key to be this result. Finally, we return the JWS verify function, sending in the token, the algorithm we want, and the API key. 
and this will return true or false if the signature of the token is correct. Now back in our cities get API, we can call our client module and our validate function like this, sending the token or blank if it's null. If it's not valid, we'll return a 401 not authorized JSON response again. But if it is valid, we'll grab all the cities from the database and send that back as a JSON string using Svelkit. Let's also show an example of a put API endpoint. Put endpoints are used for updating data, and typically the unique identifier of the record to edit is included in the URL. Plus, there's usually JSON data in the body of the request. So back in our homepage, you can see a user could edit a city by fetching cities slash the ID of the city, and it would have to be a put method. In our app, to do that, we'd create a slug folder in our cities folder and make sure slug is wrapped in square braces and this makes whatever fills in that spot in the URL retrievable in the code. So in the slug folder create a plus server.ts file and in there a put function. We do the same validation code from our get endpoint so we can copy and paste that but below that we can now grab the ID in the URL the slug by importing params and grabbing params.slug. We could also grab the data from the body, just like this. Then of course, to finish this off, we would end up doing whatever we need to do in the database code to update that one record to whatever new data got sent in. Now let's see how we can test all this once we get them set up. I'm gonna use a program or a website called Postman to test it. It's a pretty well-known API testing app. We're gonna be doing all this in our local host environment though, so I have their Windows actual software downloaded and installed, and I'm running that so that it has the ability to access local host. Up on top, I already have a Svelte workspace created, which is kind of like a way of grouping our code. And in the workspace, I'm going to create a new HTTP request. We're going to test our auth endpoint first so we can get a token. So let's change the method to post, and in the URL, enter localhost, 5173 slash API slash auth. Now, if you press the send button now to test it, we'll for sure get our unauthorized message as we didn't send an API key. So let's grab the API key from our app, then go to the authorization tab in Postman and pick the bearer token option from the auth type dropdown. Then we'll just paste our API key in the value on the right and press send. And now if we look at the bottom, we did get a response back that contains our token. We're going to need to copy this now and use it in our cities API get call. But first, let me show you why you shouldn't put sensitive info into these tokens. If we take this and Google something called JWT token decoder and go to any site like this Fusion Auth one and paste it, you can see the actual payload in plain text. So just keep that in mind when you're filling in the payload. Back in Postman, though, let's create a new HTTP request. We'll keep it at get, and we'll set the URL to be localhost 5173 slash API slash cities. In the authorization tab, pick bearer token again, but paste the token this time and click send. And now you can see we get all of the cities in our database sent back from this API endpoint. Now remember this token won't work in an hour, and if your API users or the code in your app that fetches your API happens to get a 401 status while using it, this isn't a big deal. It just means that they need to redo the auth call to get a new token. Again, you're more than welcome to alter the expiration time if you want, or have no expiration, but this just allows more time for the token to get leaked or for it to be brute forced or whatever. This is why we don't just use the API key itself to fetch the data, and why we use an expirable token in the first place. Plus, as you see, the token has the ability to store a payload, which can be handy in some cases. And I think that's about it for this video. If you have any questions about what I did, please just let me know. And thanks for watching.